Greetings, bones and ghouls. Welcome to Halloween in July 2022. We're spending the spooktacular summer indoors because not only are the horrors in video games nothing compared to the horrors of the outside world, but holy moly, it has been hot lately. As some of you know, I run a sweet special on my Patreon during Halloween in July where I cut the yearly pledge rates as low as they'll go. And this year I've got something even better for you. I made myself this extra special custom apron for all the cooking segments this year and anyone who pledges anything in Halloween in July gets their name embroidered onto it to be on display for the rest of the year. Better yet, anyone who pledges yearly at any rate gets this sweet Charlatan Wonder iron on patch as an extra thank you for your commitment to supporting me in the channel. And even better than that, pledge yearly at the $5 tier or higher and I will send you your own patron apron custom made by me with your name embroidered onto it by yours truly. Which by the way, I am making all of this stuff myself so that I can make these accessible to anyone who wants to pledge for them and I am more than happy to ship these anywhere in the world. You all voted and this year we're going to do the Night of the Stalker. We're doing all Stalker games, the mods, and maybe some other stuff since it would seem that unfortunately we're not going to get Stalker 2 anytime soon, but uh, we decided this before we knew that. So we're kicking it off with the sequel to the original Stalker, which again unfortunately is not Stalker 2. Stalker, Call of Pripyat, is the third game in the Stalker series, which makes Stalker 2's name all the more confusing since that one will be the fourth official game, but Call of Pripyat is currently the farthest out in the continuity of the Stalker franchise since it takes place a little bit after Shadow of Chernobyl. Call of Pripyat follows the exploits of one Major Tacharev, which I know I am properly butchering, who is a member of the Ukrainian military who's been tasked with figuring out what the heck happened to a bunch of choppers that were taken down while trying to establish a presence within the zone. If you somehow don't know what the zone is, it's basically what if the Chernobyl nuclear power plant also decided to break reality when it melted down. So before we get into it, it's worth saying that if you like Shadow of Chernobyl, you'll also like Call of Pripyat, because, well, they're the same series. That being said, there's a few things that are more of a step back than a step forward in this game. In case you didn't know, Shadow of Chernobyl, Clear Sky, and Call of Pripyat were all released back to back over the course of three years, which isn't exactly a lot of time to refine things between titles. I'm not going to painstakingly go over all the differences right now, because it's better to just show you them through the game. One more thing before we we get into the game. This is actually the second iteration of this video I made, with the original one never making it past the scripting phase of production. After the news about Stalker 2's delays came out, followed by the invasion of Ukraine, I scrapped the old version because, well, both of these things drastically changed the outlook on a lot of stuff, and therefore how I talk about Call of Pripyat and the other Stalker games. I'm writing and recording this in early April, and I really hope that by the time you guys are watching this, GSC Game World, the Stalker series, and the people of the Ukraine as a whole are in a much better place than they are now. Uh, stay strong, everyone. Welcome back to the zone, stalker. Here, the Major is given a falsified identity, gear that a typical stalker might have, and then is literally just dropped off in the woods. I'm not kidding. After the intro cinematic, they just drop you off on the fringes of Zatan and are like, okay, go find us those choppers, happy stalking. This can be a bit disorienting if you're not a veteran of the zone. Call of Pripyat was actually my first stalker game back in the day, which made this quite the jarring experience for my Fallout playing babby ass since there weren't NPCs ready to dump two hours of painstaking voice acted exposition in every town. But uh, maybe we'll talk more uh, shit on New Vegas later. There is essentially no tutorial, and even the quests that are meant to serve as sort of an introduction to certain mechanics are things that can go very, very badly, and you can fail them outright and also possibly just lose out on an entire quest line. The most you'll get are a quest where you learn about what an emission is, and then I think one that will require you to use a detector to find an artifact. So I start wandering off in the general direction of the boat because I've played this game before, and I am reminded of the major difference between Shadow of Chernobyl and Call of Pripyat. The zone is pure chaos in this game. There is exactly one safe area in Zatan, the starting area, and it is surrounded by perpetual gunfights in the marshes, and oh, by the way, there are mutants in there too, so for the love of God, find a shotgun or some other close-range weapon fast. There are two 
major factions currently in Zatan, and they aren't really all that organized to begin with. The Stalkers and the Bandits, and then there's everyone else in the next area. The Bandits won't immediately shoot at you, but don't give them a reason to because they're looking for one, and the Stalkers on the other hand also won't immediately shoot at you, but are more willing to help you as long as you pay them some cash. By the way, that's how you fast travel in this game. If you ask someone nicely, they can escort you somewhere, and then you're there. I think I used this like two or three times, and only because I was bored. Also, early on, you're just not gonna have the cash to spare to like tag along with some dudes to get to places easily, so be ready to leg it everywhere. In the meantime, while you're hoofing it around Satan, everything and everyone will be thoroughly trashing you. Wild dogs? Get wrecked. Whatever these things are, enough of them will do you in. Randos? It's a coin flip. The suck boys? You're gonna have a bad time. We're not even gonna see the particularly nasty mutants in Zatan, but between the early guys and the anomalies, which you are not prepared for yet, I sincerely hope you remember to save often. You're gonna be tempted to go artifact hunting and anomalies early on because Beard in the safety boat will offer you what looks like decent cash bounties for low level artifacts, but don't be fooled. While you can reasonably predict what kind of artifacts you'll find in certain anomalies, your detector is kinda shit and anomalies move around and hit you with a bad case of the deads if you get too close. In the meantime, you'll end up doing jobs for Sultan and Owl, who are the least sketchy people on the boat, mainly because they're open about how sketchy they are and also help out with a bloodsucker problem that might not actually be a bloodsucker problem, but hey, we gotta get rid of the suck boys. Oh yeah, and there's one more thing you should be mindful of. And no, it's not that stashes suck now because they don't exist until you complete a task. It's emissions. Emissions are the one thing that everyone in the zone works together to avoid. Bandits and stalkers can be in the middle of a firefight, but as soon as the call comes across all radio channels, everyone puts a pin in whatever they were doing and motors on over to the nearest shelter. Seriously, you could be in the middle of a firefight with some guys and you'll end up taking shelter together. Why? Because emissions are a reminder that the zone is basically a part of the world where reality is breaking down and that means that at random random intervals, the sky is gonna turn red and everything that isn't in some sort of shelter will die horrifically. Eh, sort of. As far as you're concerned, it's game over if you're caught out in the zone during an emission, unless you've got those sketchy pills, but that opens up a whole new can of worms. Emissions can happen anywhere in the game and at any time. They don't care if you were in the middle of a quest. Sucks to suck, my dude. All those dudes at the deal will now die and you failed the quest because of a poorly timed emission. Oh yeah, you were supposed to be doing something while you were out here weren't you? The choppers, right. The first couple of choppers in the town are basically gonna be a question of, hey, have you figured out how to navigate anomalies yet? Did you at least remember to save before you started this? Why am I not surprised you forgot to save? Then there's one that's right in the path of a few particularly nasty mutants that you won't have faced up until this point, but frankly, that's a little easier because if it's a living thing, that means it dies when you hit it with bullets. Then there's one thing that you're gonna have to find some professional help for because the only way to get to this chopper is to exploit an anomaly that's straight up invisible. Getting to each of these will net you a nice catch of loot and also a bit of the story, which is eventually gonna have you heading over to the next area of the game, Jupiter Station. You'll need to find a guy to get you there and pay him a good chunk of change, but once you're at Jupiter, the zone opens right up for you. Welcome to Jupiter Station, or more accurately, this train station everyone hangs out in nearby Jupiter. This is where you're gonna spend the bulk of the game and also where you're gonna start having enough cash to do some stuff. Back in Zatan, you'd occasionally find weapons in a condition good enough to sell off to Owl or maybe even an artifact, but most of the time that was just barely enough to get your stuff repaired and maybe enough bullets for a proper outing, if you're willing to settle for the crap bullets. Out in Jupiter, people have stuff on them that's worth it to push the upper limit of your carry weight to bring back to the store and pawn off to Hawaiian, the local vendor, so you can get some real cash for some real toys. What do you do with that money? Well, you can fix your good guns and upgrade them into better guns. Like Clear Sky before it, you can repair and upgrade weapons. There's a guy that can do it for you on the boat, but Cardin needs some booze to really get going, and also it's just more practical to give repair tools that you find to the guy at the train station, Nitro. Right off the bat, you can have all your stuff fixed and some very basic upgrades done. But if you want to get some serious upgrades that'll really give you an edge, you're gonna to have to find various sets of tools for the repair guys to work with. These are pretty hard to find, and it's just easier to have Nitro be the one that gets them because he'll do the good upgrades on you, and you also are near the ecologist who will also do certain upgrades for you. Speaking of the ecologist, now's when you're gonna meet the major factions of the zone, or at least from the first game. There's the ecologists who are in the zone to try and learn about it, and also willing to not only part with some of their fancy gear, but repair and upgrade your armor without the needs for tools because they've got them handy already, but they only do certain things. 
they'll also sell you some especially fancy gear once you're in good with them, which can entirely negate certain quest lines, or at least needing to do them. The Ecologists are the only one of the major factions that has a proper quest line in Call of Pripyat, and their quests actually help you out a lot in the end if you do them. Other than that, we got the other two major factions from the previous games, Freedom and Duty, but honestly, they don't do a whole lot in this game. They just sit on their respective sides of the train station, and occasionally a quest involves talking to one of them, and they might help you with the thing. The only real thing I found in my recent playthrough that had an effect on either faction is what you decide to do with the scandalous PDA you might come across when uh, looking at some anomalies. If I had to guess why this is, it might be because previously in the Stalker timeline during Shadow of Chernobyl, both factions tried to raid Pripyat, or at least help the player character get into Pripyat, and that was quite the fight, and it might have left them strapped for resources and manpower. But you'd think that they'd be a little more active in Jupiter at the very least. Something more than just having a few dudes sit around at a train station, you know? And now that we're a little deeper into the zone, we're gonna start seeing the freakier stuff that's a real threat to you. Controllers, burrers, and chimeras. Sure, the snorks and the bloodsuckers are pretty nasty creatures and not to be taken lightly, but a single controller is more than enough to have all your ammo expended and make you low to save multiple times if you don't take the fight seriously and do it the proper way. Listen to the stalkers who have uh, encountered them before, by the way, it's gonna help you a lot. Controllers are a whole nother mess that at the very least you know how to handle from previous games. They're just as nasty as before and will often be a major threat in side missions where a whole squad of dudes you just rolled up with suddenly becomes useless in its presence and I can't blame them. It's a bit of a steep incline on the learning curve as previously most mutants in Zatan were as simple as uh, step one, figure out what direction the thing is coming at you from and step two, shoot bullets at it. Head-on attacks don't work so well on burrs and yes, the methodology of taking down a chimera is similar to say a snork or a pseudo dog, but there is a lot less room for error when dealing with a chimera because they are faster, stronger, and way tankier than anything in Zatan. Most of these nasties don't really show up until you've done a specific hunting quest for that guy in the basement, but after you do, be prepared to watch a chimera take out a whole pack of dogs like it's nothing and then come after you because the dogs weren't entertaining enough. Oh yeah, and while they're not specifically mutants, bandits in Jupiter are better organized, have bases which you will need to deal with for certain quests, and will start attacking you unprovoked if you've got some pretty stuff on you. Now, despite everything really ramping up in Call of Pripyat as you go deeper into the zone, it's it's just not scary anymore. While Shadow of Chernobyl had big, spooky energy in a lot of places, especially in the poorly lit areas, I never felt on edge like I did while I was playing Call of Pripyat. There was one moment that was kind of spooky at first, but then I realized it was just for a quest rather than being some sort of freaky setup. It was just a puzzle. Sure, there's oh crap moments like being forced into a burr's lair before I was ready to face it thanks to an omission happening at random, but the spookiness and the vibe just isn't there anymore like it was in with Shadow of Chernobyl. There's one last thing we're gonna go over in Jupiter that's worth mentioning, and it's about what you get if you follow through on the ecologist quest line. Consistent access to artifacts. If you stick around and keep on helping the guys at the bunker with their sensor equipment and helping them figure out that for whatever reason the sensors attract mutants, you can use their sensors at your own discretion to check if an artifact is in an area. This is a game changer. Previously, you just have to trek out to anomalies and hope that maybe something had spawned in the area, but now you can just ask the guys at the lab or even check your own PDA's map to see if anything's currently spawned in in any given anomaly. This only goes for Jupiter, which does have all the good stuff in it, but also means that you have even less of a reason to ever head back to Zatan once you've established yourself there. Like sure, owls occasionally got some good stuff and you'll need to talk to Cardan for a certain quest later on, but Beard's artifact prices are crap and it costs money every time you travel back and forth between areas, so artifact hunting quests often are not worth the trip at all. There's one catch to artifacts now being something easy to obtain after doing a bit of legwork. They're just not as good as they used to be. In Shadow of Chernobyl, you could do some pretty wild stuff with artifacts, such as being able to sprint forever, being so resistant to radiation that you could almost bypass the final challenge in the uh, game, be impervious to certain kind of damage and more, like you get the idea. Here in Call of Pripyat, artifacts give you only slight buffs that even when you creatively stack them aren't particularly meaningful, and I can suddenly understand why Teenage Me didn't bother much with them when I first played Call of Pripyat all those years ago, because in a more short-sighted sense, pawning off high-level artifacts in order to afford nicer gear upgrades is a much better choice if you don't want to spend hours upon hours grinding to get good artifacts.
Let's take a break from the zone and have ourselves a little cooking segment. Tonight we're going to be doing some macaroni and cheese the right way. No blue boxes involved. If you've never done proper mac and cheese before, it's never going to be the same for you once you do it. Like sure, I keep some of these blue boxes on hand in case I'm hungover or something, but this is forever going to be what you think about when someone says mac and cheese. No more blue boxes, no black plastic microwavable tubs from the freezer aisle, or whatever the heck they're calling mac and cheese at chain restaurants these days. As always, our first order of business is prep. This is going to be chicken bacon mac and cheese, and if you want, maybe add some buffalo sauce or something. And it's best practice to get your meats ready the morning you are going to be cooking this for dinner. So things are going to go a lot smoother leading up to the evening. This isn't bad at all. Just open up a package of bacon and cook all those little strippies. Maybe even have one or two for your breakfast. Make sure you're reserving the fat that rends out between batches of bacon in a heat safe container like this ramekin. We're going to want to save that for later. And also, if we leave lots of grease in, not only is that a safety hazard, but it's going to make the bacon soggy as we cook it because essentially we go from frying it to deep frying it as more bacon grease accumulates. If you want to keep the kosher halal or any other lifestyle choice that means you don't eat bacon or other pork products, just skip this step. And anytime we mention bacon grease, just use butter. Once the bacon's done cooking, set it aside on a paper towel lined rack and let it drain for a bit. Now would be a good time to start running some water over your chicken breasts to get them thawed. Be sure to keep everything separate for now. Go ahead and roughly chop your now drained bacon into small crumbly bits and put them in a container for later tonight. It also might be wise to line said container with paper towels so that any excess grease that drains off the bacon after its first draining section won't make the bacon soggy. Once your chicken is thawed, go ahead and butterfly it, which is also known as just cutting it down the middle, not quite all the way through, and then transfer it to a paper towel lined baking sheet, put some more paper towels on top of it, and then place another baking sheet on top for an excess water removing sandwich. Into the fridge it goes. Now that that's taken care of, now is the time to prep your breadcrumbs if you wanna do it, but it's cool if you wanna just buy them or skip this altogether. Now let's fast forward to an hour or so before dinner time, and we're gonna prep the mac of our mac and cheese. This is the easiest step. Put the pasta into salted, boiling water and let it cook for no more than seven minutes before draining and setting aside. Actually, let's be productive here and just throw it straight into the big pot since we're gonna let it go and mix up in there anyway. It doesn't have to be all the way done here because it's gonna cook some more later. Just have it be cooked enough to where it easily squishes with a little bit of pressure from a cooking utensil. Now we're gonna cook out the chicken real quick and we want that ready when the time is right. Pull your now drained and flattened chicken out of the fridge, get a frying pan and give it a little bit of that bacon grease from earlier, season the chicken how you'd like it, and give it a quick cook on high heat for about three minutes on each side. We're just aiming for a nice color on the sides here. Hopefully your chicken will have been flattened enough to where it's done after this quick sit in the pan, but if it's not, that's okay. It's gonna be finished in the oven. Set that bad boy to 350 heat units of freedom, by the way, if you haven't already. Uh, wait, no, hold that thought. Actually have it set at 325 degrees of freedom heat units uh, because this dish has a lot of butter in it and butter has a smoke point of 350 degrees. So if you have it set to 350, you're gonna smoke up your whole house and it's not gonna be a fun time. So just keep it down at 325. Set the chicken aside to rest while we get the cheese ready. Once we're done with the next step, it should be ready ready to cut. It's time for the cheese part of our mac and cheese. Get a high walled saucepan ready and get out the cheese you're gonna use. I'm going two parts mild cheddar to one part sharp to one part provolone for that ooey gooey goodness. Start grating your cheese into a bowl and yes, buy the blocks and grate it yourself. It's cheaper and pre-grated cheese doesn't melt for crap. Once it's ready to be thrown in, don't do it just yet. Now take a whole friggin' stick of butter and melt it down in the saucepan. You can let it go for a bit and make brown butter if you want, but it's not gonna be much of a difference since we're gonna sweat that moisture out anyway. Start making your roux by sifting flour into the soft pan and uh, stirring it until the butter absorbs it all. Once you've got some weird curdly things in the pan and no signs of moisture, it's time to add moisture back in because that's just how it works. Take some milk or half and half and start slowly, bit by bit, mixing it into your roux until you've got a thin bechamel. We want it to be a little on the thin side and if anything, we'll likely have to add more liquid in anyway because the next step is to make the sauce thick. Set aside a couple good sized fistfuls of your cheese mix into a small bowl and then start stirring in the rest of your cheese like you were stirring in the flour earlier. Now keep at this until all the cheese from your main bowl is gone. If it gets too thick to stir or properly melt the cheese, just carefully stir in a little more of your liquid of choice and keep at it. Once it's all done, carefully transfer your mix into the big pot. I've tried to transfer this all directly into the baking pan before and it, it never ends well, so don't 
try it. All right, it's all gonna start coming together now. If you decided to add chicken, bacon, or both, cut your chicken breast into small fork size strips and then add most of the bacon into the big pot. Stir that bad boy until it's all mixed good. This is your mac and cheese, but it's not quite ready. Get a good sized casserole dish like this one right here and use the now cool bacon grease you reserved this morning to liberally grease the bottom and sides of the dish. If you don't do bacon for whatever reason, just use pan spray. Now take your mac and cheese from the big pot and carefully pour it into the pan using a wooden spoon to guide it in there and then flatten the mixture evenly into the dish. Now we're gonna take the breadcrumbs if we're doing those, spread a light layer over the top of the casserole dish and then spread the extra cheese and bacon we set aside earlier to give the top of the dish a cool crust. Maybe add some chopped green onions or some other green thing too for uh, variety. Okay, now toss that sucker into El Horno set at 325 degrees and if your chicken is pretty much cooked, you can do it for 30 minutes. If it's still pink in the middle, you're gonna wanna put it in there for 45 minutes just to make sure all that salmonella goes by. Once it comes out, let it sit for at least another 10 minutes before using a spatula to cut into it and serve. Congratulations, you just made some sweet ass mac and cheese. So you've spent some serious time in the zone now following leads on how to get to those down choppers, figuring out where the survivors went, if there were any survivors, and generally doing stalker stuff to blend in and help work towards your goals. Along the way, we cleared out a lot of mutants, caught a traitor that was trying to take credit for her exploits, and I accidentally became a high-ranking figure among all the bandits of Zaton after siding with Sultan about that whole thing with the Svarg detectors, because, uh, I guess that's what happened. Like, gee, I just wanted what was owed to me. I didn't want to like bring down Beard's whole operation. Now I have like four of these things too and I can't sell them. So they just take up space in my stash. Also Beard now pays me a small sum every time I visit Zaton and he hates my guts. Everything you've learned about the zone and what happened with the botched operation leads up to one clear course of action. You need to get to prep yet. That's not exactly gonna be easy though. Sure, we got there once before a Strelok, but uh, things have gotten way, way worse since then. And even Monolith can barely operate inside of prep yet now, if you can call what they do operating. This is gonna be a big operation and you're not going to be able to do it alone. The first order of business is figuring out how you're going to even get into Prepyat in the first place. Mild spoilers. It turns out that Jupiter Station had an underground tunnel that was meant to connect it with something in Prepyat, but shortly before everything went down, it was sealed off and filled with gas to prevent people from using it. Okay, so we now know how we're getting there. Just, uh, it's a matter of finding someone who knows how to open the massive doors and then making sure we don't asphyxiate within a couple minutes of going in. After finding some documentation on the doors, Nitro, who's been fixing all our weapons up at the train station, says he'll do it, but only if we give him a a lot of backup as Jupiter isn't exactly known for being a safe place and smart money's on some pretty nasty stuff being down there. So now we just need a team to help us keep Nitro safe and a means of staying alive inside the tunnels, which comes from the form of getting your hands on a close cycle suit, which requires either an elaborate and overpriced special order back at Zaton from uh, Owl, or you can just buy one of the extras that the ecologists have laying around if you're cool with them. Seriously, just do the latter though. It's way easier and you'll want to do their missions anyway for the artifact bonuses. That just leaves a a team. Nitro advises you to talk to a guy named Zulu who lives outside of the train station and after indulging him with some light binge drinking, he gets the ball rolling and tells you to start sending him dudes. You can just try uh, pretty much everyone you've interacted with before this point in the game. You can ask that guy in Zaton who always answers the door with a shotgun, but he's not down. Neither is Trapper because he's all old and stuff. Uncle Yar is also not gonna help you. Freedom and Duty would love to help you, but they got sidelined in this game, so uh, never mind. Who is willing to help you is one of the guys from the helicopters who survives the crash and now is hanging out with the ecologist since he wants to reunite with the rest of his force. That guy you massacred an entire bandit base for is willing to lend a hand since you were nice enough to murder everyone remotely involved with that one jerk extorting him. And there are uh, essentially no innocents in the zone. We're okay, we were right in what we did. Okay, that's two guys 
Dance plus Zulu. Maybe one more and we'll call it good. So there are these dudes out in the boonies who are dressed up like monolith soldiers, but claim that they're no longer under monolith's mind control. If you help them reintegrate into society, one of the guys will be down to join your little expedition into the tunnels as a thank you for helping his squad. Okay, showtime. This is probably the hardest fight in the game and it's a long slog through the tunnels. There are no points where you can safely rest and rearm. Make sure to gear up and take advantage of how you have access to some pretty heavy weaponry now, like the street sweeper shotgun or an assault rifle with a fully loaded and well-stocked grenade launcher. You should bring both of these, a Svarog anomaly detector and optionally a nine mil or better sniper rifle because the tunnels are going to be a fight. Grab every med kit you can and as much ammo as you can carry. If you grabbed everyone, your chances are decent, but don't expect to get past this without a fair bit of saving and reloading. One of my guys also got stuck operating a door here and I had to restart the whole thing. So on top of a whole lot of mutants coming out of the goddamned walls, Monolith shows up with a crapload of dudes right as you are about to make it into the final stretch. To make matters worse, you've got to slip through a series of anomalies to get to the control tower to open up the other door, and your guys are exposed. Monolith has good cover and the high ground. Oh, and also the room is filled with mutated rats and snorks from before Monolith showed up. It's going to be a long fight, and there's a good chance you're going to have to scramble over a lot of dead Monolith soldiers to find some extra ammo to snag towards the end of it, but hey, you made it. Something that's nice about the final area that my stupid teenage brain didn't realize when I first played this is that even though you're pretty much at the end once you get to Prepriat and don't need to go back for anything for the rest of the game barring one quest, you can still go to the other areas if you wanna. One of the guys that was real interested in finding a way to Prepriat does just that like literally a day after we went through all that hell to get in. And thanks to how there's no real way to get money in Prepriat for reasons we'll talk about in a sec, it doesn't cost anything to leave Prepriat with the guide, but it's gonna cost a pretty penny to get back in, so don't leave unless you've got some proper business to attend to in the rest of the zone, like handing over some endgame tools to your weapons guy of choice, or maybe you want to make a crap load of money selling excess artifacts that you found in Pripyat which you don't need. But aside from that, welcome to Prepyat. Major Dijarev uh, reveals his true identity and some of the guys get upset about that. It's no biggie though. The military has been holding out in an old laundromat that's just getting by waiting for you or frankly anyone to come and find them. But after investigating the choppers, you're pretty sure at least one of them was intentionally shot down and they share your theory. No airlifts come until you figure out why that's happening and who's doing it. In the meantime, free stuff, baby. The guys at the base will repair all of your gear for free and you also get a free allotment of health items and ammunition of your choice every day. The only catch is the guys at the base won't do any modifications to your gear, so you gotta go back to the outer zone for stuff, which would probably be a good idea to get anyway, since you're gonna wanna grab those tier three weapon tools laying around prep yet and get some tier three mods on all your gear. Also, while you're there, ferry over all your weapons to your stash in Pripyat because you're going to want to have the good stuff handy. Most of what you're doing for the military is helping them keep Monolith off their backs, and if you play your cards right, reverse engineering a Gauss rifle that one of them drops. I suggest doing that quest because once you pick up the Gauss rifle, you can't stash it because it's a quest item and the damn thing weighs 10 kilos. So head back to Zatan for a minute, have Cardin tell you some cool stuff and he gives you a key card to access the laboratory where they built the thing. And once you get some stuff there, you can have it fixed for you and use it to utterly annihilate anything you pointed at or just toss it in your stash and forget about it because it's one of the heaviest guns in the game and also short of RPG. RPGs, it's the priciest ammo in the game. And if you're at the point where you can stash a railgun, you're also at the point where you're shying away from the traditional cautious and precise combat that you normally do in a stalker game, and you just roll loud now. You've got scientific medkits to spare and a fucking machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. The rest is more the same. Up until you do the serious stuff, everything is monolith. Patrol missing? Monolith. Weird radio interference? Monolith. Gotta clear a building to get to a secret lab? You bet the monolith goons are gonna be hanging out in force around that building. So we've shot a lot of monolith dudes and busted up a few of their weird little piles of trash that are interfering with our radio cops. Let's go over to that weird building where the big lab is and learn what we can about the zone. Before you go down though, make sure you go up to the roof and grab those rare top tier artifacts that are up there. This is the one of only two labs you get to go into in Call of Prepyat, with the other one being the one in Zaton we just talked about where we do the Goss Gun quest. It's a lot bigger than a lab you can find in Shadow of Chernobyl though. If you count the surface level, it's easily the biggest lab in the series, and underground is where all the good stuff is, but that isn't an easy affair. 
Short of the Chimera and Bloodsuckers, just about every high level mutant is hiding in here, including the famous Triple Brewer Room. I don't have any RPGs handy, so I just ended up charging in there, grabbing the document I needed, and running the hell out because for some reason this room is glitched and the burrs inside have absurdly high health regeneration, making them impossible to kill with conventional weapons. Lab X8 is less of a lab and more of a dungeon. There's secret passages, treasures and hidey holes, and traps in the form of anomalies like everywhere. It's five levels deep and not for those who came unprepared. That being said, there is some good stuff in this lab if you're willing to find all the loot. You could in theory come out of lab X8 better prepared than when you came in if you're judicious with your ammo and loot everything there is to loot. Just don't forget that we came in here for a reason. There's a total of six documents that you need to find in lab X8 and if you want the best ending you're going to need to get all of them. Factor in the triple burrow room and having the final document be right in there behind all three of them and this is easier said than done. Most documents are either somewhere where some pretty nasty things are hanging out or just in the middle of a patch of anomalies, but one or two of them are pretty easy to get. Spend all the time you need grabbing them and then just get back to the base. The boss tells you that they've been getting some pretty weird radio signals and that no one can pin them down because they seem to be moving. You don't have to do this right away and can get some shopping and upkeep done beforehand, which I'd really suggest you do since you probably found the LMG in Lab X8 and most likely want to have the cash to fix it up and kit it out. Okay, spoiler warning from this point out, you know what to do if you don't want them. Going, going, gone. So you track down the radio interference and whatever it seems to be, it seems to be moving through the underground tunnels in Pripyat, which sounds pretty familiar. Things get pretty wild as a strange thing starts heading right for the base and hey, what do you know? It's Strelok from the first game, who was moving around underground like he did when he first ventured into Pripyat before the events of Shadow of Chernobyl. Strelok confirms a canon ending where he performs an advanced vibe check on the sea consciousness and now the zone is no longer being contained by anyone. A side effect of this is that now the anomalies reset every time there's an emission, which which lines up with some of the information you found at X8. He also doesn't seem particularly bothered that I'm using his favorite gun, which he left for his buddies. We all get ready to head out and well, it's kind of the opposite of the final battle in Shadow of Chernobyl, where the first game's final fight was a long slog that was so grueling, GSC put entire fresh sets of gear for you at several points. Call of Pripyat's final push is laughably easy. Maybe it was because I had one of the best assault rifles in the game, the auto shoddy and the previously mentioned machine gun, but perhaps Monolith is more crippled than they let on earlier from the fall of the sea consciousness and the recent efforts by you in the military. But the force they send out is considerably smaller than the force that tried to stop you in the tunnels, and to put a band-aid on that, they throw in a few zombies, which just eat up some bullets. We get to the chopper no problem and the credits roll. The Major is offered a promotion, but declines, instead opting to be the warden of the zone. After you do that, you get a slideshow of how you handled everything during your time in the zone, from the boat to the ecologist to the duty and freedom power struggle and so on. The only real thing of note here is that upon discovering what the Major retrieved from the Lab X8, the priorities have been shifted to concealing as much info as possible about what was going on at the labs that took place in Chernobyl, and Sherlock now heads up a research project to learn more about the zone. The end. Until Stalker 2 comes out, eventually. So if I had to call it, Call of Prepyat is the most polished of all the Stalker games so far, and the one that has the most QOL features in it. But it has nowhere near the same level of atmospheric spookies as the original game. It also isn't so helpful that while technically this is the most refined game, it's also the most obtuse as you're literally just thrown into the woods without a proper tutorial area, and you have to hope you pick up the right quest to teach you the right things before you start doing main objectives. Beyond that, I also noticed that while this is not my first playthrough of Call of Prepyat, so I had an idea of where to go, my footage to play this game was about two hours longer than my Shadow of Chernobyl playthrough, which was my first time playing that game. That being said, Shadow of Chernobyl felt deeper than Call of Pripyat and like there was a lot more exploring and stuff to do to it. This could be because Call of Pripyat straight up gives you the means to grind for artifacts if you wanna, so that might have added a few hours to the playtime. Regardless, it's still a good time and a proper sequel to Shadow of Chernobyl. That's gonna do it for this first night of Halloween in July. Be sure to like the video and make sure you're subscribed with that bell so you know exactly when the next installment of the Night of the Stalker goes live. In the meantime, stay safe, stay indoors, wear your sunscreen when you gotta go out, and enjoy this cat video. Saucy boy. Saucy boy. Ooh, that autofocus is a little squirrely. I know somebody else who's squirrely. The squirrels.
I keep on eating the stuff we put outside. It would be a little hard to get a pet with this. This is a heavy boy I got here in my hands. I hope this microphone's on. What? A handsome boy. Were you sniffing the microphone? You a sniffer? <laughs> now he, oh, you're headbutting the lens. Oh no, maybe you shouldn't do that. This was very educational. 